Art is a truly global language that can change our perceptions about the world we live in. In today's lineup, flying high in Japan, up close and personal with DNA art in Canada, and children in Colombia using tin cans for cameras. Hello and welcome to Arts World. I'm Imran Garda here in Doha, the capital city of Qatar in the Middle East. Just behind me, on the shores of the Gulf, stands a new Doha landmark, the Museum of Islamic Art. It's a jewel in the crown of Qatar's bid to become a cultural force in the region. Built on a man-made island, the Museum of Islamic Art is a place set apart for research, learning and creativity. Like much of Doha, the architecture is new and modern, but also pays tribute to its Islamic heritage. It was designed by internationally renowned architect I.M. Pei and will be a center for academic research. It's an impressive sight, but it's what's on the inside that has international art historians buzzing. The museum has a top-class collection of Islamic art and aims to promote Qatar as a bridge between past and present, east and west. I'm very, very privileged to be here, uh, as it were, in charge of a collection of this quality. The collection here is not enormous compared with some of the more established museums, but it is of extraordinarily high quality. It's also special that it covers in a very broad way the entire Islamic world in a museum sitting in the heart of the Middle East. Inside the museum, craftsmen are hard at work getting it ready for the official gala opening at the end of 2008. It's all part of a bid to establish Qatar as a cultural destination in the Gulf region. The Gulf in general is becoming a focal point uh, for Muslim and Arab culture, which is nice to kind of to center that in one area. The collection has taken many years to amass. The artifacts date from the 7th to the 19th centuries and originate from Asia, Africa and Europe. But until the museum's opening, most of the items remain a closely guarded secret. The artworks show the diversity of Islamic art across a variety of materials. One of the most distinguishing features in Islamic art is the art of writing or calligraphy revered for its role in preserving the Qur'an. And the key new thing that the religion and the new political empire had, had brought with it was the Arabic language with the Arabic script. And so the Arabic script becomes the key, as it were, symbol of the Islamic world. And that is why it has such a profile and such a status in a way that writing in the West simply didn't have. The word calligraphy comes from the Greek word for beautiful writing. This art form still has many followers today. Calligraphy is a very mathematical art. Um, it's the spacing of the dots that define the, the size of the letters. Zahra Balir is passionate about promoting the arts. She works as an art translator at the museum. She's brought her younger brother Hani here from London to take calligraphy classes at the Youth Creative Arts Centre in Doha. I came here because uh, I'm really interested in uh, Arabic calligraphy. When I see Arabic, when I see the, the calligraphy, it's like so inspirational. I see the different shapes, the different techniques of using a pen. Is there nothing apart? So to learn it the orthodox way, where he learns the actual skill from a master, because that's the way they learn. They have a master and then they have the, the apprentice. I've learned a lot, so it'll improve my art skills, hopefully. These courses are not just for native Arabic speakers, but also for expatriate residents. There is something um, mysterious about, about calligraphy, but because they don't understand what is behind the, the beauty of the, the letters. Aesthetically, it's a very nice writing. It expresses uh, a lot of things, especially thoughts. Uh, you have uh, philosophy or poetry. Arabic calligraphy attracts many art lovers, and it's not restricted to being learnt or loved only by Arabs or Muslims. It attracts many people, especially since the recent arrival of many foreigners to Qatar. Many foreigners take courses with us because of their love for this art. Local Qatari artist Ali Hassan used to teach at the center, but now he spends most of his time in his studio at home. Much of his work hangs in top hotels around the city 
and is sold internationally. After years of traditional calligraphy, he's now experimenting with Arabic letters. I don't search for the meaning of the word. My job is to find the beauty of the Arabic alphabet. The intricacy of his former work has given way to a focus on individual letters from the Arabic alphabet. So today with the letter Noon, I also benefit from my surroundings, from the environment I'm living in, in the sun, the desert, the ocean. I wish to transfer them to my work on the letter Noon. Despite his changing style, Ali still believes in the value of traditional Arabic calligraphy. He believes the increasing popularity of these courses and the opening of the new museum bodes well for the renaissance of traditional Islamic art. And when the museum opens, Ali intends to be first in line. Of course I will attend. I will be the first one there. It's a chance for us and we must benefit from it. Doha is a city of construction with cranes everywhere you look. Now in ancient times in Japan, long before cranes were invented, the Japanese used to use kites to carry tiles up to the top of the temples and the shrines their workers were building. Now in the modern age, kite flying is still a popular leisure activity, but the art of kite making is under threat. First of all, kites have to fly, so you have to make them even on both sides and make them light. Also when it flies, you have to make them look good, so the picture must be concise and nice. As a young man, Masahiro Osumi dreams of becoming one of Japan's salary men. He wanted a stable desk job, one with a good pay and a rewarding pension. But fate took him down a different path. My father was a kite maker, and he died when I was still a student. So it was only natural for me to take over his job after graduating from school. Nearly half a century later, Masahiro and his family continue to make traditional handmade kites, mainly for the annual Hamamatsu Festival in May. The event celebrates a district family's firstborn with the launching of a kite. Proud parents commission kites costing up to 2,000 US dollars. Each three meter wide kite is painstakingly crafted using bamboo and treated paper. The delicate kites take up to a year to construct and are eventually destroyed during the festival's ferocious kite battles. I really enjoy the kite fights. I do not feel any sadness in seeing the kites getting destroyed. But I like watching them colliding spectacularly. I'm still happy, even when the kites get destroyed. But Masahiro's joy may soon disappear. In busy, modern-day Japan, birth rates are declining. So is an appreciation for Japanese tradition. Many festival participants now prefer to buy cheaper kites manufactured in factories across China. Masahiro fears for the future of his craft and the festival. It is part of festival to celebrate the first born of the family. Something I hope will not change. And I'm hoping that my son will take over from me and keep this tradition. And it looks like the torch has already been passed down to his son Bungo, who willingly gave up his desk job to take over the family business. I remember thinking as a child that I may become a kite craftsman. And as the time passed and I became a certain age, it was kind of natural for me to start up. Someone that was not part of the kite maker's family might have different reasons to become one, but it was only natural for me. Bungo's work, however, goes beyond the studio. On festival day, he leads one of the teams made up of the Hamamatsu families. After months of preparation, it all comes down to this. 
Bungo's team versus more than 170 kites up in the air. What's at stake? Honor and dignity of the district and the future of traditional kite making. The team and family look on anxiously as the auspicious kite rises and falls. Are the conditions right? Will the team be successful in their launch? Eventually, the kite stays soaring in the sky, signaling a happy, prosperous future for the child and the district. Bungo too shares in the celebration, proud that the kite that he and his father had carefully made has brought so much joy. For today, at least, the traditional kites live to see another festival. But who knows how long this Japanese culture will last. We're taking a short break now, but when we come back, we visit a laboratory in Canada using science to create art, and we see children in Colombia documenting their lives with a tin can. Join us again after the break. Welcome back to Arts World. I'm here in Doha, the capital of Qatar, at Souk Waqif, a marketplace where you can find local handicrafts and artworks. Artworks that generally remind you of ancient traditions. Now, by contrast, over in Canada, two young men have pioneered a very modern form of art. They're creating pieces of art out of your very own DNA genetic code. Art does not get more personal than this. In this nondescript building on the outskirts of Montreal, important cutting-edge research is carried out involving DNA, the genetic code that is unique to each of us. Normally, the research scientists would be studying, say, DNA from a calf to determine whether it has the right genetic makeup to produce a lot of milk. Today, though, they're dealing with a request from their most unusual client, based 150 miles away in Ottawa, the Canadian capital. Two friends, one a trained scientist, the other a marketing specialist, came up with a fun idea that would surprisingly transform both of their lives. And it all began with a brochure on DNA imaging equipment. I saw something that really intrigued me and to me it looked more like a, like a Mark Rothko painting or an abstract piece of artwork and less like a scientific image. When I was looking at these images they really had a scientific uh, meaning to me. Uh, it was not until Adrian and I got together and Adrian saw an artistic perspective of it that it actually came together um, where a light bulb kind of came off. It wasn't let's start a business, it was more like this would look beautiful on my wall. Can we make a sample? Can we make one for me? And that's how it really started. New orders are taken over the web. You can select color schemes and ask for almost any size print. Then you receive a DNA collection kit. Jason is their newest customer and was impressed by the artwork's uniqueness. It is you, it is your, your, your signature. No one else in the world is gonna have this piece of art. Your DNA is collected with a simple mouth swab. First, there was little support for the business venture. In the beginning, I think my former colleagues thought I, I went completely insane. Um, you know, I, I, I left a, a well-paying job. Any banker would have looked at us like we're crazy with this idea, and they wouldn't have invested in us. I was probably chased out of about 10 biotech labs. Uh, they didn't really understand the concept. They didn't think that there was actually a market for this. But a trickle of orders soon became a flood, and they've never looked back. DNA extraction is a complex procedure involving numerous machines, some moving slowly and very precisely while others spin liquids at high speed. Before finally an electric current is applied. And this is what is produced, the sort of DNA blueprint featured in countless crime shows around the world. The image is sent as a file to Ottawa. I guess if you had to summarize it, you might say Andy Warhol meets CSI. But it's inspired by some of the great abstract and pop artists with a completely unique new spin on it of adding the whole layer of science and personalization. It's amazing how every single person looks at our portrait and sees something different in it. 
open up the transform button. Some of our clientele only look at it as a design perspective and they just think it's a really cool idea. Another group look at it as an emotional representation of their DNA and the essence of who they are. Another group of people really see the genetics component, the science component. Naz and Adrian are now supplying customers in more than 50 countries. They're coming up with new ideas too. How about having your lips enlarged? Or perhaps a giant fingerprint? The possibilities seem limitless. So is it really art? Well, surprisingly, the art world has embraced us, which is not something we expected. Even the Museum of Modern Art um, has accepted our art form and they sell it through all their design stores. The artworks don't reveal any medical secrets, but they are helping to fund important research. Whether it's AIDS research, cancer research, um, diabetes, we've always been a company that wants to give back to medical research or to other worthwhile causes around the world. At the end of the day, what you're looking at is something very special. It's your life code. It's what makes you unique. I'm looking at some of these old photographs of Doha. It's amazing how quickly a place can change in such a short space of time. Now, on the outskirts of Bogota in Colombia, a group of children are also using photography to document their environment. With tin cans for cameras, they're using photography as a means of expression and a way to turn their lives around. What's most fun about pinhole photography is that you can see strange things. So if I take a picture of something I want to photograph, and aside from capturing what I wanted, I can distort or tangle the image a little bit, or make it smaller. That is very cool. When we do photography with pinhole cameras, the children cannot believe it. They ask how an old teen can take a photograph. So we tell them it really is possible. It can be done. I couldn't believe it. They said we were going to build our own cameras. These are pinhole cameras, and she showed us a video of some kids making their own cameras. A pinhole camera is an ordinary tin with a small hole called the pinhole and it basically works with light. Pinhole cameras are a long-established invention. Just a tin with a pinhole and photographic paper inside are enough to produce beautiful and powerful works of art. I love them. I'm fascinated by their work, how they write, what they say, what they shoot, and what they choose to shoot. These kids live on the outskirts of Bogotá, in Altos de Cazucá, where more than 60,000 people endure extreme poverty. Many had to flee the armed conflict in the countryside, their education and their childhood interrupted. They live in an unsettled, dangerous environment with nothing to look forward to. One could say the situation of children and young people in Kazuka is the saddest of all. These are kids who don't dream of finishing school, but of finding work. All they find is friends who offer them a gun or drugs. So we stand against this. We tell them, here are some other tools. Shooting cameras for peace is a photographic project where we propose an exchange. We give them a tool to use, and young participants give us their stories. Julian spends most of his energy shooting with cameras he has built himself. He and his friends are very interested in capturing the best angle of the place they live in and showing the life they live. OK, here's what we're going to do today. We will go out shooting pictures of the neighborhood to show people these old tins are no longer old tins. They have been turned into pinhole cameras. We will show them it is really true we can take photographs with our old tins. We will show them some parts of the neighborhood, the place where we live, what we like best about it.
Since the project started in 2002, hundreds of kids from Kazuka have shared their images with their communities and with the world. If you look at their photographs, you can see they don't register very hard or painful moments. Instead, they register their happiest moments. They take pictures of the people they love, and whatever turns out to make them glad, that's what they want to picture. Ready? This time I want to take a picture of my mother. Let me introduce her to you. Her name is Nelsi Macias. Hey, Mum, say something. Now, Mum, stand here like this. I believe when a kid shoots cameras for peace, when he writes or makes his artwork, when he's able to ask his dad to respect him, to listen, tell him he can speak and have an opinion, this creates peace. I mean, peace begins in his family, at home. Through the magic of photography, the kids have come to understand that their images show others their reality and this allows them to express their feelings. To support them in the idea of photography means never to lose their dream. Why? Because we cannot be deprived as human beings from getting to be someone in life. That's it for this edition of the program. Be sure to join us next week where we'll be lighting up your screens with another edition of Arts World.